Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the final Humanities Forum event of the school year, school semester, sorry. My name is Raymond Hain. Uh, I'm a member of the philosophy department here and the director of the Humanities Forum. One of the most important goals of the forum is to find ways to bring the often disparate and sometimes rival parts of our campus together in order to share in a common intellectual life and reflect on questions that are deeply important to all of us. It's therefore a special honor and pleasure to introduce to you this afternoon our final guest of the semester, Professor Sylvia Maxfield, Dean of the Providence College School of Business. Dean of the Business School since 2012, Dean Maxfield earned her undergraduate degree from Cornell in government and economics, and her PhD in political economy from Harvard. She then joined the Yale faculty with a joint appointment in political science and the School of Management. After almost 10 years at Yale, she became a senior sovereign analyst and vice president at Lehman Brothers, where she was responsible for research and advising with respect to emerging markets. During this time, she was also a visiting lecturer at Harvard and a fellow of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. In 2002, she left Lehman Brothers for the Simmons School of Management, where she held many leadership positions and was the chair of the MBA program from 2009 to 2012. In 2012, she left Simmons for Providence College, where as dean, she raised substantial funds for the new Ryan Center for Business Studies and has overseen significant growth and development in Providence College's business programs. In addition to her leadership work, Dean Maxfield is also a widely published author with seven books, over 60 articles, still counting, on risk, regulation, and governance, with a special focus on finance and globalization. Her most recent book project, with the delightful title, Atlas Constrained, analyzes financial markets as open systems not amenable to the universal laws analytical approach currently dominating economics. This warms my humanist heart, uh, I have to say. On a related theme, I should add that she herself is an excellent model of interdisciplinary engagement with the humanities, having regularly taught, uh, almost since her arrival in the DWC program, I think the fifth semester How many is times coming ten? up. And I learned recently, too, sat through the third semester of DWC, um, pretty soon after arriving yep. as well, which is remarkable. Her title today, connected very much to these themes, is Economists and Humanists in Narratives about the U.S.'s Global Financial Role. Please join me in welcoming Dean Sylvia Maxfield. Thanks, Ray. I think that's the best introduction I've ever gotten. So you're hired for those few times when I need an introduction. Well, thank goodness it's Friday. Uh, thank goodness it is this particular Friday because this uh, talk has been weighing on my mind the entire semester. So I am feeling very elated that it's, it's off my shoulders now that I've got about an hour to entertain you and then I won't have it weighing on my mind um, again. However, I will because uh, this is uh, let's see, how am I doing here? See if I can make this work. Oh, I got it backwards. Um, this is part of a book project. So it actually weighs on my mind all the time. This is a picture of me um, working on my PhD dissertation <laughs> that my then roommate uh, and then eventually one time co author um, took of me. And at that time, uh, I was a pretty unreconstructed positivist. I was trained in the positivist tradition of social science where you come up with a theory, you collect a lot of data, and you try to predict the future. And my interest when I was working on my PhD dissertation and, and all throughout my entire career, whether it was at Lehman Brothers working on Wall Street or whether it was in academia, has been in the circumstances under which financial markets and institutions serve the public good. And financial markets and institutions were designed and evolved historically to be a public good, to help economies grow, to help wealth accumulate. 
uh, to um, help all boats rise, to use a liberal metaphor. Now, most of the time, they don't work that way. And so I've dedicated my intellectual career to thinking about the ways in which it seems as though we can make them work better. Hence, a lot of focus on risk and on policy and a very interdisciplinary approach. But I always did this in my career with a positivist bent. We are going to identify the secret sauce that is going to allow derivatives regulation to finally uh, work so that derivatives don't wreck the, the economy. And this talk is really, um, underlying it is a story of my evolution away from being an unreconstructed uh, positivist social scientist because this book that I'm working on, and you'll catch glimpses of it here in this talk, uh, doesn't predict anything. And that will be the first time in my career that I've tried to publish something where I wasn't being a positivist social scientist and trying to say, I've discovered a model where X, Y, and Z predict uh, the future. Um, so it's part of a book project with a delightful co-author. Both of us share a career that spans Wall Street and uh, academia. We actually competed against one another. Um, he at Morgan Stanley, myself at Lehman Brothers for the business of underwriting uh, emerging market bonds. Um, so we knew each other as competitors and then um, became co-authors. Um, there's lots of empirics in the book. Um, and, and maybe um, I could talk about those later, but I'm not really going to talk about them much um, today. So um, the, um, the article that I passed around to those of you who were interested in reading something beforehand uh, quotes um, a lot from a book by Mahir Desai, who is a finance professor uh, turned humanist at Harvard Business School, although he, he, do, he teaches at the business school uh, despite his humanist turn. And he says, in finance, we've lost the ability to think through the questions that humanities force us to think through, and humanists no longer speak to as broad an audience as they could be speaking to. And, and that really um, summarizes a lot of what I've been thinking about um, as I put this talk together. So the title of the talk, Economists and Humanists in Narratives About the U.S.'s Global Financial Role. And there are three narratives by, by my construction of, of this literature. One is the U.S. as imperialist top dog. A second is the U.S. as benevolent top dog. And a third is as the U.S. in decline. And I'm going to briefly uh, try to outline uh, each of those three. Then I'm going to talk about economists and humanist approaches to how we would know which of these three narratives more closely approaches the reality that we are living. And I will then um, give you my answer uh, at the very end. So um, the U.S. as imperialist top dog. Uh, the U.S. dollar is the most used currency in the world. Any econ majors in the, in the crowd here? Couple, any finance majors or professors? Few of you. Um, so if you've taken econ, uh, introduction to econ, you've probably heard that a currency serves three purposes. It is a measure of value, right? So something, a t-shirt costs $12. Uh, that is a measure of value. It is a vehicle of exchange, right? I can, I can purchase a t-shirt um, for this paper money. And it is also a store of wealth. Take out my phone, look at my bank account, not overdrawn. Uh, so those are the three purposes of currency. And the currency that the US issues is the dollar, the US dollar. And it is the most widely used currency in the world. And so the core of the argument that the U.S. is an imperialist top dog is that we, how do we get U.S. dollars? Where do they come from? It's up here on the, uh, on the screen. They're printed. And there is no governor on the printing of U.S. dollars. Just crank up the printing press and more dollars come into the world. So 
the core of the reasoning behind the contention that the US is an imperialist top dog is the fact that everybody wants our currency and we can just print it. And, and that's, that's an obvious statement to most economists. Now, um, we can print it without restraint. Um, and that means what's going on in this picture. This is Uncle Sam being served the world. The fact that we can print dollars without restraint means that we can buy anything that we want at any time from anywhere. Right? I just said everybody wants dollars. Dollar, US dollars are the most coveted currency in the world. So we just crank up the printing press and go out and buy anything we want. So here's Uncle Sam eating, eating the world. Um, a little bit more technically, it means that we can buy from foreigners goods and services that cost more than we earn by selling things to foreigners. Now, if you do this as a company, if you purchase more as a company inputs in order to produce what it is that you make, if your costs are far greater than what you earn by selling what your company makes, what happens? You go bankrupt. So that company story, and the same thing happens with a household. That company story, that household story, does not apply to the United States. This is the logic of the US as imperialist top dog. That's the story. And it allows us to run a trade deficit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, the second story is the US as benevolent top dog. So this is a very, very different story. Uh, this is a picture of Atlas uh, carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. You may or may not know that uh, Zeus defeated the Titans. Atlas was a Titan god. Uh, and um, as his punishment, Zeus uh, banished him to um, a particular place and said he had to carry the weight of the world on his shoulders. Now, he actually um, carried the weight of the heavens, according to the mythology, not uh, the globe. And the reason that the car atlas carrying the weight of the globe has become the common vernacular is because of this sculpture, which is a replica of a Greek, Greek sculpture um, that somewhat mischaracterizes the original story. This sculpture is, um, was bought. It's called the Farnese Atlas. And it was bought by um, a gentleman who eventually became um, Pope III. Um, and he acquired this sculpture and put it in his, in his gardens at, at Farnese. Uh, so this is a very apt metaphor, uh, history and mythology, right or wrong. This is a very apt metaphor for the second narrative, the second narrative being the US as benevolent top dog. This to historians, I see at least one in the audience, um, certainly historians of international affairs, is a very, very common depiction of the United States in the post-World War II era. And the notion is that the, the US defended, built and defended the liberal order, the liberal global order, which was about making the world safe for democracy and making the world uh, of open to free markets, to capitalism, uh, to competitive type exchange, um, un, un, un market governed exchange. And so the US was for all of those good things at the end of World War II. And it put its money where its mouth was by saying, we are going to spend resources. We are going to dedicate the US's hard earned resources to supporting this global liberal order both militarily, hence, for example, uh, the common meme that the US supports NATO um, to a greater extent than the European countries themselves. We were going to go above and beyond. We weren't just going to pay our share of supporting the liberal order. We were going to pay far more than our share. That is the notion um, of the US as benevolent top dog. And I actually stand here before you because of that stance, um, my mother was a Marshall Plan uh, scholar to Cornell University for one year 
my mother, bless her heart, was um, not allowed to go get um, an intellectual education, um, although she tested such that she could because my grandmother wanted her to not get a lot of far-flung ideas and wanted her to marry the farm boy down the street. My mother was from a very small town in southern Germany. So my mother, bless her heart, got a job essentially as a receptionist for a communist-leaning labor party in Munich, which was a, a, some distance but commutable from, from my grandmother's home in this little tiny Bavarian town. And lo and behold, my mother, who was extraordinarily bright, never did finish an undergraduate education, got this scholarship to spend one year at the Industrial and Labor Relations School at Cornell University, basically learning how to be a democratically oriented labor union supporter as opposed to a communist-oriented labor union supporter. And of course, my mother met my father, and I'm here before you giving you a lecture. Um, so that is the notion of the US as benevolent top dog. Now, this, is, this, this has been very applicable um, in the last decade because of the financial crisis, right? So you, I don't know if any of you remember Bernie Sanders saying, you know, we shouldn't be bailing out all these banks. Um, you know, the, the, the financial crisis is of 2008 is deep, dark history to, to freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors today at Providence College, but to most folks my age, it's still very resonant, and we are marking the 10-year uh, anniversary of that, of that crisis. And, um, for example, one of my colleagues at Tufts, um, Daniel Dresner, wrote a book called The System Worked, and what he said was, the U.S. pulled the world away from the brink of economic collapse in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis by putting a lot of money on the table. And all of that quote unquote bailout money went relatively unrestrictedly to any global bank, whether it was a US domiciled global bank or whether it was a French or German domiciled global bank. And this led Bernie Sanders on the floor of the, of the US. Um, uh, is he a senator? Yeah. He's a senator. He's a senator on the, on the floor of the U.S. Senate to say, you know, this is just crazy. We can't be bailing out French banks. Um, and of course, this is the epitome of the U.S. as benevolent top dog, putting billions of dollars on the table to rescue the world economy. The final narrative is the U.S. in decline. And I'm not writing a declinist book, but, but one of the challenges that I've had with this intellectual project is that I am painted with the same brush as the declinists, and um, that just may be inevitable. So Gore Vidal published this book um, in 1992, and this book is, is far-reaching, and I'm not going to talk about it, but, but it, it's emblematic of the declinist view, which really I think he did, I think he started the declinist perception of the U.S. But the reality is that in 1975, the U.S. earned more money by selling goods and services abroad than it spent buying goods and services abroad. I talked about that when I talked about the U.S. as, as imperialist top dog. And when you sell things and earn more money to foreigners than you spend, buying things from foreigners, you have a trade surplus. You've probably heard that in the news currently. It's actually a topic of conversation in US-Chinese relations and in the summit that's going on in Buenos Aires right now. Um, so the last time that the US did that was in the late 1970s. In 1975, the US had a $12 billion trade surplus. And by 1987, it had a $153 billion trade deficit. And in 2017, which is the most recent time for which we have officially confirmed triple checked data, guess what? The US had a $566 billion trade deficit. So this underpinned um, the, the popularity of the declinist narrative. Now, there's all kinds of criticism of the declinist narrative. There are, there are scholars who talk about waves of declinism. Every generation thinks their country is in decline. There's documented cognitive biases that lead us to think that our times are worse than anybody else's times. Um, and and the, Trump, the Trump presidency has certainly leveraged that cognitive bias, right? There's, there's been a powerful valence with the American voter around the notion of America in decline and the need to make America great again. 
Um, and the, the notion underpinning that is that it is far too expensive for the US to be a benevolent top dog in the global economy. And we can no longer be a benevolent top dog at the expense of the auto worker in Ohio or wherever else it might be. Um, so those are the three narratives that I promised um, to cover in this talk. Which one is closer to reality is really the question that underpinned the intellectual journey that my co-author and I set about on. And it's really a question about what the value is of being the country whose currency is the most widely used currency in the world. Is there imperialism underpinning it? Is there tremendous value in it? Um, is there tremendous burden in it? Um, or is it something that you can only sustain for a certain period of time and then like the Roman Empire, um, the US Empire will, will turn and fade? So to answer this question, to go to the second part of my talk, um, ways of knowing, economists um, have a, a pretty hegemonic approach um, to answering this sort of question. The question being, what is the value of being the country that issues the currency that everybody in the world wants? And um, this is actually a, a, an equation that somebody in the room might recognize. I don't know. It might have something to do with Boolean physics. I, I, I don't know. Um, but economists' approach to knowing is, is a very um, mathematical one. You can count anything. Um, you can find metrics to measure, you can get data, and you can predict things. And so value is predictable. You just have to get your theory right and marshal enough data, and, and value is predictable. And in terms of answering this question about what is the value of issuing the currency that most everybody in the world wants to own, is that we're going to calculate the net value of the US's international assets and liabilities. So up until this point, you've been following most of what I've said. I think I've been very painfully clear. And now the going is going to get a little bit tougher. So bear with me for the next 10 minutes while the going gets a little bit tougher. What is a balance sheet, right? I just said that economists' approach to knowing is that you can calculate the net value of international assets and liabilities. Those international assets and liabilities live on a balance sheet. Um, what is a balance sheet? A balance sheet is one of three critical financial statements. I'm sure there's finance majors in the room. Um, I think I asked you that before. Um, those are the income statement, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flows. And um, any, any um, Finance major and accounting major is going to be familiar with, with those things. Um, in a household context, you're sort of, you should, if you have any sense of personal finance, be fairly constantly calculating your own personal balance sheet. What are my debts? What are my, ass what are my assets that would allow me to repay those debts? And, and so a balance sheet mentality is the cornerstone of an approach to personal financial planning, to household financial planning, and, and um, to, to corporate financial planning. In the corporate case, it's a little bit more complicated than just assets um, and liabilities because you have to talk about equity, but we're going to ignore equity for now. So we extend this concept of a balance sheet to a nation, and, it, and we, know, we don't look at all the nation's assets and liabilities. We only look at the nation's international assets and liabilities, right? So here's where it gets complicated. So what we're, the, the analytical conceptual core of this crazy book that I'm working on is this notion of an international balance sheet. We call it an external balance sheet, but it's easier to just say international balance sheet. And um, so it's quite simple. It's what the US owns and controls in other countries whether that's um, loans it's made to other countries, whether it's the bonds purchased by companies that are domiciled in some other country that we own, whether we being the United States writ large and the we actor is either a household or an individual or a bank or a company. And we subtract um, foreigners' um, claims on US assets, otherwise known as the US's international liabilities. So from the US's international assets, we subtract the US's international liabilities, and we get something called the net international investment position. And this is the core um, of the empirical analysis that Ian and I have been 
um, doing for several years now. And we have come to the conclusion that you can understand history because the book is far more historical than it is predictive. As I said, I'm done making predictions at this point in my career. And our, our, under, our depiction of the US's um, international role historically is that the US has gone from being a banker to the world, which is more or less consistent with the benevolent top dog, to being a successful world venture capitalist, which is arguably a little more consistent with the US as imperialist top dog, to being an overly leveraged failing venture capitalist, which is arguably consistent with the US in decline. Um, so this evolution of the US's history seen through the lens of the US's net international investment position interestingly parallels the three narratives that I laid out. So what, is, what do those mean? I will bore you um, or give you a, um, a bastardized um, financial economics, international financial economics lesson for just a few minutes. So banker to the world, um, this was the US in the 1950s predominantly and, and somewhat into the 60s. The US is making loans to the rest of the world. It's sending cash out to the rest of the world in return for a contract that says I owe you money. So this was a very simple international financial service. Um, meet, and, and mostly um, making relatively long-term loans. Um, the US was actually financing those loans by issuing um, relatively short-term government bonds. But, but all you need to know is you need to think of the US as acting like a banker. And the main international assets and liabilities that you're finding on the US and its major partners' balance sheets are just loans. Very simple, wonderful world, finance as it should be. Moving into the 1980s and, and definitely, no, I mean, starting actually in the 70s, um, the US is buying, um, not making loans to the rest of the world. It is um, sending cash out to the rest of the world in exchange for stocks and for companies, which is what we call financial uh, foreign direct investment. So instead of mostly sending cash out to the rest of the world, remember we're the benevolent top dog, by making loans, we're sending cash out to the rest of the world by buying other companies other countries' companies, or setting co companies up. You know, the US built the auto industry in Latin America in the 1970s. Um, that was US cash going to Latin America. That was Ford and GM having plants in, in Brazil and Mexico. And, and of course, the way that that worked in a venture capitalist sense is that the US was earning um, income or dividends from those enterprises and reaping the value of the increase in uh, valuation of those companies. So if they were sold, the US reaps a windfall. Now, by the current decade, the US is increasingly having to take on loans to finance these um, ventures that it has overseas. And those ventures that the US has overseas um, are lagging in terms of the dividends that they produce and the growth in valuation that would be realized if they were sold. So it's a little technical, but, but you can see the evolution um, in the external balance sheet if you get down into this, this data. You can see the evolution through the lens of the US's international balance sheet. So we're in the economist um, realm of knowing. Um, and here's, here's a pretty um, stark picture. This is a chart that simply says loans and bonds are safe assets, and owning stocks and foreign companies, um, foreign direct investment, are risky assets. And you can see what's happening is that the US's um, balance of safe assets, um, this is, this is the percent, this is the amount, the value of the safe assets the US um, owns versus the safe assets it owes, right, so this is a net, um, is getting very, very negative, and the um, balance of risky assets that it's owned is piling up. So this means, and, and bear with me, because we're being, it's a little technical here, this means that the US is short, it, this is a technical trader's term, I remember I worked on a, on a Wall Street trading floor, the US is short safe assets. It owes the world safe assets. And the US is long risky assets. The world owes the US risky assets. Are you with me? 
Now, this is the incredible irony of this story. What this means for the United States is that when the value of safe assets goes up, the US gets further into a negative net international investment position. Because remember, the US owes the rest of the world safe assets. So it doesn't have them. In order to, to balance everything out, the US would have to buy safe assets if everybody wanted to call those safe assets that the US owed them. So because of this situation, when the US dollar gets stronger or the US financial markets rev up and outperform, the US's net international investment position deteriorates. This is quite an irony if you think of the US as a top dog. Quite an irony. It means that every time the US dollar gets stronger, the US is, if you, would, if you want, would allow me to call the US's net international investment position, it's debt, which is not entirely accurate. The stronger the dollar, the more in debt the US. Crazy. That does not sound like an imperialist top dog. Um, it may be a benevolent top dog, but it might be the US in decline. Um, so that is a, that is a funny um, irony. And, um, so just to, to continue with um, w down this rabbit hole, it's not just the US vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world that you can um, identify through an international balance sheet analysis. You can actually parse out the US's relation with particular other countries. So we can begin to see the balance of, of value between the US, say, and Germany, right? So you can, you, you can see where um, we might be able to understand um, some of the complexities of US-Chinese relations or US-EU relations um, through this lens. And um, the things that mostly change the balance of value between the US and another country are the currency exchange rate between the US and that other country, the composition of each country's assets on its external balance sheet, the four most important ones being loans, bonds, stocks, and companies, otherwise known as foreign direct investment, and then the relative performance of the two countries' um, financial market sectors, right? So um, if the US and Germany um, equally exchange the same amount of stocks, but the US stock market does much, much better than the German DAX, then the US's balance sheet valuation will outperform the German balance sheet valuation, leading to um, perhaps the ability to predict the balance of power based on the balance of valuation of international assets and liabilities, right? So this is a very economistic um, way of knowing, and, um, and it's pretty different. Um, it, it, this, is, this is basically how the argument goes, that um, market-mediated exchange is a problematic thing, and this balance sheet analysis shows you the balance of power through this market-mediated global financial exchange. Power is predictable because we can predict the value of international assets and liabilities, and power is ultimately um, the ability to withstand breaking that pattern of exchange of assets um, between two countries, right? So this is where we get to a picture of how economists would approach the question of what is the value of issuing the currency that the, that the world most wants, right? This is how economists would, would approach this. They do what Ian and I have done. They, they, they drill down into the balance sheet. Um, they can see the balance of valuation between two countries, between the US and the globe. And we can extrapolate things about the relative leverage that the US might have over China or over the EU based on this very um, economistic approach um, to data. Um, now, I promised I would talk briefly in the uh, roughly 10 minutes I have left about the humanist's approach, right? We're finally getting to the humanist piece of this. Um, there are two pictures up here. Um, 
anybody know which one is John Maynard Keynes? You, uh, shout it out. The one on the right, the one on your right is John Maynard Keynes. This fellow um, is Simon Gladell. I was mentioning him to Professor Zato earlier this week. Um, and they're both really great examples of, of the humanist approach um, to knowing, right? We're now talking about the humanist approach to knowing the answer to that question. What is the value of issuing the currency that the world most wants? Um, and Keynes's view presages um, an article that was in the New Yorker that asks whether economists and humanists can ever be friends. It was an article that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and that, the point of that article is that economists think you can reduce absolutely everything to simple rules, um, and humanists like to wallow, I'm quoting the New Yorker article, in the full complexity of every situation and individual. Um, and, and, and Keynes actually, I'm going to argue, um, is a humanist as it, when it comes to this question of um, the value of issuing um, the currency that the world most wants. And this is, this is an amazing quote from Keynes. So I'm going to read it, even though it's up there. At any given time, facts and expectations were assumed by, he was criticizing what are called the classical economists, to be given in a definite and calculable form, and risks of which, though admitted, not much notice was taken, were supposed to be capable of exact actuarial computation. The calculus of probability, though mention of it was kept in the background, was supposed to be capable of reducing uncertainty to the same calculable status as that of certainty itself. Actually, however, we have as a rule only the vaguest idea of any but the most direct consequences of our acts. Thus, the fact that our knowledge of the future is fluctuating, vague and uncertain, and this is the critical sentence, uh, phrase, renders wealth a peculiarly unsuitable subject for the methods of classical economic theory. So what he's saying here is that you can't boil everything down to a probabilistic calculation. And that wealth, the valuation of wealth, is going to be a particularly challenging place to try to boil everything down to an economistic calculation. Um, now, um, so that's Keynes as a humanist. And then I'm going to go back to, um, to my dear um, friend here, Simon Gladell. Um, Simon um, was a, um, a derivatives trader, um, like your dear Professor Zato here um, was at one time. And he wrote a book. Um, he's written a ton of books, mostly about how to um, trade derivatives. But he wrote a book in 2010 called The Metaphysics of Markets. And he invokes Kant in that book um, to a conclusion that is very humanistic in terms of valuation of financial assets. True knowledge of valuation could not well be, uh, uh, true, val true knowledge of valuation could well be not merely practically unattainable, but a priori theoretically inaccessible. Bankers all too often forget that they're trading in assets. They are trading in assets because they are misvalued. That's why you trade things. They all too often forget that that is an act of faith, not probability, but faith. Their valuation is a subjective impression of what is quite likely unknowable. So Simon, this very successful um, derivatives trader, has also turned humanist on us. And both Keynes and Gladell are asserting that we cannot know the future value of financial assets. You see where I am going. Um, and I am nearly done. Um, I know this is getting um, a little bit dry. Um, this is, what is this? This is a black swan. And the black swan became part of the popular lexicon in 2008 in the aftermath of the great financial crisis um, as a metaphor for events that are very surprising and have great impact on society. Um, and the, um, the medievalists didn't think that black swans existed. 
and in, in medieval Europe, and, and in fact, they do. Um, and black swans are very, very rare, um, but they do exist. So the, the black swan metaphor that a fellow named uh, Nasib Taleb, uh, Taleb um, put forward in his book um, was that as the world gets more connected through these international balance sheets, the impact of black swan events becomes more and more important. So black swan events are these unpredictable things that are quite rare, but through the rise of global financial markets at which sit the US in the center, black swan events become far more impactful um, with ever, every, every passing year. And um, it's even worse because if you apply the black swan metaphor to financial markets, you start to get into the realm of statistics, where you discover that many of the statistical assumptions that are used by derivatives traders and others to predict value, many of the fundamental tools that you learn in Finance or Math 217 are not accurate. You should still try to do your best in, in Finance 217. But um, for example, this is um, a picture of two distribution curves. The normal distribution, otherwise known as the bell curve, is a staple of intro to finance. And it, is, it is, depicts a world where there are no black swans. So if you believe the black swan metaphor, you're in a world where um, this is the likelihood on the vertical axis. It's the likelihood of an event where valuation is more than three standard deviations from the average. The average is this line here, right? So if we're trying to predict the value of financial assets in the future, which remember Keynes said we were foolhardy to try to do, and Simon Gladell said we are foolhardy to try to do, um, if you're trying to predict the value, we're all doing that using a normal distribution. By we, I mean. Um, financial market participants. Um, if the likelihood of an event where valuation is, is more than three standard deviations from the average is very low, you're in a normal bell curve like this with very skinny tails. If you're in uh, a black swan world, there's a much greater likelihood of an event where the va future value of the financial assets you hold is more than three standard deviations from the center line. And we call those fat tails. And the black swan world is a world of fat tails in the distribution of expected value of financial assets. Wow. Pretty, pretty intense. Um, so that's the definition um, of, a, of, a tail, of a high tail risk world. And, and most people believe that we're getting close to operating in a high tail risk world, um, or closer to operating in a high tail risk world than a, than a, than a normal world. Um, this, is, this, this theory is applied not just to financial markets, but it's applied to weather science and all kinds of, of scientific areas. Um, so that is um, the humanist's approach. Um, to the question of what is the value of issuing the currency that the world most wants. Um, it is that we can't really predict that value. So um, we're not in the world where economists are saying, we can certainly predict that value. And you can see here um, the perils of a very globalized um, financial system at which sits the US in its center. Um, so the. Um, the future of the US's global financial role. Remember, I've laid out three narratives, which one is closest to um, reality. Um, what's the future if the value of the assets and liabilities that I've spent a lot of time trying to measure by looking at balance sheets of countries is indeterminate? How can you possibly say which of those narratives is closer to reality? This is, anybody know who, there's got to be somebody in the room who knows who that is. Yeah? Guesses? Yeah. 
It's kind of hard to know, and it's a little bit obscure. Um, this is um, the um, this is Proteus, the oracle uh, old man of the sea. And does anybody know that that particular myth of 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 the oracle, the old man of the sea? So he could foresee absolutely anything in the future. He could tell the future with a hundred percent certainty. He's a derivatives trader's dream. Um, but he wouldn't ever tell the future. And he, Proteus could take on the shape or form of anything in order to escape captors who might be trying to squeeze the truth about the future out of him. So protean, protean after Proteus means changeable in shape and form. And the future of the U.S.'s global financial role is protean. It is changeable in shape and form. There is no way to predict how the world's global financial markets are going to evolve and what the U.S.'s role will be. And there is no way to do that, I would contend, because I have ceased believing that we can build models that predict the future value of financial assets that we can spend a lot of time looking at um, on through, through the lens of an international balance sheet. Thank you very much. We have about 25 minutes for discussion. I'd like to start, if possible, with a student question first. And if you would wait, let me bring you the microphone just so that your question is recorded uh, throughout the discussion period. That would be perfect. Any brave students? If not, we don't have to start with a student. Faculty, you don't look like a student. No, I thought we Go ahead. No, we'll skip them. Come in, come in later. Unless one last chance. Jim, you're not a student either. A doctor, if Black swan, from your perspective, black swans aside, if a decline cannot be predicted, were it to happen, could you describe it? <laughs> the point of thinking about, um, about the way power is derived from financial uh, asset valuation is, is, is that it is protein. And the, the notion of protein power, uh, which has been written about in the last couple of years by one of my professors from Cornell, Peter Katzenstein, some of you in the room may know his name, um, is that in any given circumstance, there is so much endogeneity, to use a statistical term, that you can't predict things, right? So the, so the example that we use in the book is, um, you know, a, a certain class of financial assets appears to be languishing in the financial markets, demand is, is falling, its price is falling. Well, if some crazy woman trader has read my manuscript, she starts to recall, geez, Sylvia and Ian talked about some really weird things. And she calls up her other friend and says, maybe we're approaching a one in a 100 year financial market event. Um, and, and so the market begins to, to change simply because, you know, Lila Day happened to read my manuscript. That's an example of the way completely unexpected events occur in situations and change the course of their unfolding. So I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't even know if we're approaching a once in a hundred year event. Thank you for that. Um, I'm a little confused by what hum you mean by humanistic. <laughs> you can't mean by humanistic knowing, because it seems to me that humanistic is the lack of knowing, So, uh, which is not how people in the humanities think what they're doing is not knowing. Um, 
So I'm a little confused. Do you simply mean that the world, because economics, I guess, is made up of human beings, and human beings will occasionally produce black swan events, therefore an economist who has forgotten that they're talking about human beings need to be reminded of that, and therefore to know that no matter how much statistical work they do, there will always be, as you put, fat tails on either side. That seems fine, because you're just bringing in the word human to economics, but that's not humanistic knowing unless I've, I've missed something. Um, I'm way out over my skis. I am not a humanist, as much as I um, have read some Greek mythology and um, dabble in art history and the occasional book on the history of uh, the Catholic Church. I am not a humanist, so I'm pretty far out over my skis. And um, I, think, I think you've boiled it down, Jim, to a very, very simplistic and somewhat inaccurate um, terminology to talk about a humanist's way of knowing. Tim. I'm not, uh, yeah, no, I'm not supposed to be calling. Uh, sorry, so I, this is actually a good follow-up to this because I think, uh, I guess, some of the humanists whose knowing is about not knowing, I think it's the philosophy department and some of my students or former students in the audience won't be surprised to hear me talking about Socrates, who I was thinking about at the beginning. And then I wondered if he was out of place and then by the end it seemed like we ended up in this very Socratic place that wisdom is knowing that we don't know. And so I started out, as I always do, when sort of seeing you know, the humanities up against uh, you know, the sciences, including the social sciences like economics, sort of worried, what do we have to offer? Because I at least think a lot of my knowing is knowing that I don't know, uh, in philosophy at least. Uh, some of my colleagues might disagree for themselves. No doubt they'll agree with me. But, um, but now I wonder if we're getting the same answer now about economics. So if it's also a way of knowing, right, we, we take these tools, we show how much we can do with them and then how much that falls short. And with Socrates, at least, you get this somewhat enigmatic but promising answer that even though we can't answer the questions, there's some value in the process of asking them and sort of going back over them. And I at least hope that's true by the end of the term with my students. And I wonder if, what's the value of these economic tools if at the end of it, we don't know? And there are, econ there are financial economists who are trying to you know, figure out how to take a world of fat tails and turn it into a world where you can predict things. Um, so, so yes, you're right, economists are trying to embrace this, the, the, the possibility that we don't have large enough numbers to really um, identify a, a bell curve, right? Because to identify a bell curve, you need, a, you need a regression to the mean. You need a lot of data and enough time for there to be a regression to the mean. Um, so I, 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 I think your, your, your point is, is um, well taken. Economists are, have not yet embraced the idea that there's value in not knowing. They're, they're busy trying to figure out how to make economistic knowing out of black swan events. Uh, if, if you feel that the models aren't there, what recommendations do you give to people who have to figure out what they're going to do next uh, to react to whatever's happening? And I do um, sit um, on the um, pension board of the state of Rhode Island, and those of you who have Rhode Island relatives who are owed a pension, um, whether they are firefighters or policemen, I actually sit on a uh, town person board, and um, we are charged with figuring out how to invest uh, the limited assets that the pension fund has so that they can return enough money over time to pay out those pensions in full. Um, so I would hate for it to be public as a member, as a public servant operating in that capacity, I would hate for it to be public that I am throwing up my hands and saying there is absolutely no way of predicting the future. Um, so obviously, um, this is an intellectual exercise um, that is, um, you know, very much um, a, a hobby for me. My day job is to, is to run a business school and I still um, obviously sit around that table and for example, we evaluate private equity investments and you, you certainly make some judgments about the firms that are before you saying, give us $100 million and we will return you 14% uh, over the next coming years because we've returned 21% over the last few. So, um, it, but but my, my, my answer to your question is, 
Um, I would never want to sit on the board of any kind of financially oriented entity if I didn't feel I was reasonably capable of understanding the arguments they were making about why their investments are good investments. And certainly leading into the financial crisis of 2008, you have plenty of former board members of financial institutions who said, we had absolutely no idea that was going on. And we would never have understood even if they tried to explain it to us. And so I guess my answer is, um, you know, keep things simple and recognize that there is a certain amount of faith involved. <laughs> um, you're not really trying to pull a Proteus on us where you know the answer but you won't say. <laughs> um, that's suspicious. It, it seems like, and am I right, Gl Glidell and, and Keynes made a a lot of money in the markets, right? They did. Yeah. How they did it, I, it's, it's a miracle. Um, is it, the, they come to these conclusions, not from humanists, but they actually, from the inside, from economics, they say, oh, it's so complex and it's all this and that. So, to use a more humanistic words, they actually kind of deconstruct economics from the inside by saying, oh, these, you know, we can't really rely on this stuff. It, they don't rely, I, I mean, I'm not sure where humanists come in at all. I mean, they can blow themselves up, it seems, by themselves. So where do the humanists come in? Where do, I'm sorry? Where do the humanists come in? Because it seems, maybe they call themselves human, but it seems like the kinds of arguments that they adduce for saying, we can't predict this, it's all too complex. Is, um, the, humanistic, the, the humanistic piece of it is, um, a, as Jim quite clearly put it, we're talking about humans and humans, an individual, it is the reduction of history to the circumstances of, you know, an anecdote where, you know, the, the Serbian prince gets shot. Um, you know, what would have happened if the Serbian prince had not gotten shot? That's, you know, um, so that's, that's the sense in, that's the anti, it's maybe not humanist, it's anti-economist because the, the point is that there is an individual path that evolves because of a unique episode that can't be predicted, that involves an, a human being, as, as Jim put it. So that's the, that's the it's, maybe it's not humanist, but it's anti-economist because economists think that absolutely everything can be boiled down to a set of patterns that we can recognize and therefore make whatever it is we're studying amenable to prediction because we can recognize patterns in absolutely everything. You and I teach behavioral ethics and behavioral ethics is about recognizing um, the, 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 the patterns in how humans respond in certain situations. Keynes and Gladell. Well, so take Gladell. He made a ton of money and he got out yeah. and started. So yeah, and now he's writing books called The Metaphysics of Markets. So, you know, there's a, there, there is a humility in that career path. It's like, I got lucky, you can't know this stuff, and I'm going to quit, you know, while I've got my kids' college paid for. Maybe. Uh, there's been crises, you know, before uh, 2008. I remember the savings and loan, uh, was yep. the 80s? 70s, um, yeah. Uh, it, locally in Rhode Island, we had the um, credit union uh, collapse. I think that was 90, 91. And then afterwards, um, different um, fixes are thrown in, some regulation, uh, capitalize banks better. And then they get eroded, it seems to me, through politics. Um, is it um, mistaken thinking to, that, those, that those fixes would lower those fat tails? Um, I think it's mistaken thinking, not so much because they get eroded by politics, but they get eroded by the creativity of financial markets themselves. So, you know, f financial market players are sort of like, um, you know, 
fish in the ocean or the, no, they're more like the water that's in my basement right now. So you get somebody in to put a sump pump in one corner. This is exactly the analogy. Guy comes in in March and puts a sump pump in the corner where all the water's coming in. And I go downstairs last week and there's water coming in somewhere else. Well, the water found a way in my, through my foundation. Financial markets find ways in to profits around regulation, right? So you can regulate, that, that's, the, that's the incredible financial market regulator's dilemma, is it that you regulate something and creative people um, find a way to get around the regulation. And that, that's just, that's regulators in financial markets are always playing catch up. They're always trying to figure out the next thing. It's just inherently problematic to think that we will be able to um, solve the information asymmetry problems of financial markets through regulation. Why is it that globalization didn't distribute risk better? I mean, if the black swan is a bad event and you distribute markets around the world, why is it when Italy has a problem my bank account feels it. Well, and that's because of the size of global financial markets and the interconnectedness that, that, that Ian and I have been studying by looking at countries' balance sheets. So, um, you know, there, there is actually slightly less interconnectedness today. There's, there is a modest retreat from international financial exchange underway. Um, and so one prediction that I have been on record talking about is I've said the one thing I do know is that we will see a pretty dramatic decline in the amount of international financial exchange before the next thing happens. Um, and, and that's that I make that prediction just because it seems like the system is vulnerable to these black swans and, and at some point that vulnerability is going to become increasingly part of the, 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 the kind of popular mindset. And the political outcome of that is going to be, you know, less, less international banking. Yeah, isolationism. And, and, you know, I gave a definition of, of power as based on Machiavelli's notion that you should use your own arm. You know, you should you, uh, mercenary. Machiavelli's argument was if you use a mercenary army, you're reducing your own power because you're, you're, you're having to pay for a, a mercenary, right? So his, Machiavelli was very much an isolationist in that. You know, his conception of power applied to what I'm talking about is an isolationist prescription. And I do think um, it's likely that we will see um, a retreat from financial globalization at some point in the next 50 years. I mean, that doesn't mean much, but I mean, we're already seeing it in some ways because, you know, your, you know, your, your, your bank account is vul potentially vulnerable to something that happens in Italy and the ability that, our ability to trace the connectivity and how much sensitivity there is between your bank and what's happening in Italy is, 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 is challenged by the complexity of global financial markets. So what uh, just occurred to me was the, the phrase that I remember picking up when I was taking political economy classes in grad school is neo-mercantilism. Is that the world we're going to? That instead of a vision of a global system that's positive sum, we're in fact entering a zero sum global economy where my gain is your loss. Is that? I think that the, the, the popular perception of um, I think the popular perception of the benefits and costs of being involved in the in global financial markets pushes in that direction. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? We'd be in a very different situation in terms of US withdrawal from global trade, you know, had a few elections results gone a, a different way, you know, at, at, at certain times. Or maybe if Hillary Clinton's emails hadn't, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> but I do think that um, both Bernie Sanders and Trump, so on the extreme right and the extreme left, there has been a leveraging of economic insecurity um, to blame the world, right? And that's politically constructed. 
that's partly my point here is that we don't, you know, we're not really, uh, one of the criticisms of declinism is that the US standard of living um, on average has continued to, to grow every year for the last 100 years. You know, what, what does it mean to say the US is in decline? That to some extent is a construction that has caught on on the extreme right and the extreme left because of relative deprivation experienced by large swaths of the US population and politicians who've figured out a way to leverage that so that they can get elected. And I, I'm not an expert at this at all, but it would seem to me that a country like China, which would be sort of the contender then, you know, for whatever the US's position is, that's much more of a mercantilist country in terms of its attitude toward trade, toward international relations, and much less of a liberal country. And so that's not just a perception of people in the United States. That's a powerful international actor, in fact, embarking on a particular strategy that's more zero-sum oriented than positive-sum oriented. So look, there's, there's plenty of people out there forecasting the future, right? One of, one of them is um, that China is going to eventually recognize, as the US came to see at the end of World War II, that it has to open its financial markets. The, 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 the China's largest barriers are not on the trade front. They're on the, they're on the financial side. And so one, one story that's out there is, look, China's going to have to realize it has to step up to the plate. It's going to have to open its, its domestic financial markets more than it already has. And at that point, the Chinese renminbi will become the, the dominant currency in the world, eclipsing, uh, eclipsing the United States. Um, but, but so China, yes, China is, is quote unquote mercantilist in some ways. It's far more so on the financial side than it is on the international uh, trade side. Uh, Ian and I, if you put a gun to our heads um, and said, predict the future, what we would say, based on the empirical analysis that we've done, is just in terms of China-US struggle, what we would say, we're sort of Europhiles. We would say, um, it's probably not China, it's probably slightly multipolar, but Europe's gonna play a pretty big role. And currently, when people look at the future, it's all, oh, we're afraid of China, we're afraid of China. And, and you know, the final chapter of this book says, um, you know, we don't really need to be, if you look at, it, the, the data in these balance sheets tells us that the relationship between the US and Europe is far more portentous of the future than the relationship between the US and, and China. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that was kind of, uh, but I don't think he is. I, I, I don't think he is. I think Donald Trump, um, but I think Bernie Sanders could have been elected just as well. I, I do think that there is the political, uh, because of, of the difficulty that so many Americans are having, um, uh, in imagining they would ever live as well as their parents, the, 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 the political landscape is fertile for the argument that we should not be engaging with the rest of the world. We have to turn inward, we have to take care of our own. Um, and that is certainly the story of, of, uh, you know, of the interwar years between World War I and World War II, right? The US, had, um, the US was incredibly isolationist in that period. It's sort of a miracle that the US entered World War II, right? There's this, the theory that we created Pearl Harbor in order to turn the political tide in the United States in favor of the US fighting Nazism, which is hard to believe, um, but there is a strong, strong strain of isolationism in, in American political history, as people in the audience know far better than me. We have a reception in the great room just down the hall. Thank you all for coming, and let's thank our speaker. Thank you all so much. I'm flattered that everybody came out on a Friday afternoon towards the end of the semester.